Good evening and welcome to the continuation of our series, Alumni Cocktails and Conversations with the Dean. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, uh, extended conversation with alumni of the College of Visual and Performing Arts uh, at George Mason University. I'm Rick Davis and I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of CVPA and of uh, having taught three of the folks who are uh, going to uh, be with us tonight and uh, certainly well acquainted with the fourth. So it's a, it's a really kind of a homecoming night uh, for me here uh, as it will be, I'm sure for many of you. Uh, this series began uh, pretty soon after the, the pandemic started. Uh, last year, we created Mason Arts at Home, and in fact, launched the very first program of Mason Arts at Home on April 2nd, 2020. So we jumped right on the ball uh, and started providing digital content to our communities, plural, uh, at the Hilton Performing Arts Center, at uh, the College of Visual and Performing Arts, and, and the Center for the Arts, uh, based on the Fairfax campus. And we have been so gratified by the response that our audience has given us, literally hundreds of thousands of viewers, uh, and a, a real conversation that we have started. And it's actually gone sort of worldwide on, on occasion, uh, which has been very gratifying. The Alumni Cocktails and Conversations program is a chance to engage with successful CVPA alums who have uh, really made a mark in artistic fields and in other fields. And tonight we're going to see a little bit of both uh, as these wonderful graduates have taken their artistic training and moved it beyond, in some cases, the initial premise uh, that we thought we were teaching them <laughs> here at George Mason. And they've done some incredible things uh, in the world. Behind that idea is I think one of the most important things and one of the most important messages that I really want to share with you and, and ask you to help broadcast in the public discourse right now, uh, if you agree with me, and that is that a good education in the arts is a good education, period. When you get a college degree in the arts, especially at a place like George Mason University that combines professional training with a, a liberal arts sense of breadth and inquiry, you are receiving terrific formative education and training that allows you to succeed in a number of fields. It allows you to ask critical questions. It allows you to analyze information. And perhaps most importantly, it encourages you to bring your creative and collaborative self to any project to any problem to any new venture and i think you'll understand after seeing these wonderful uh, folks tonight how that has been true in each of their lives uh and each of their projects going forward so uh without further ado i would like now to introduce our distinguished panel uh we have mr aj faraj who was a theater major uh we have akande who also was a theater major, and I had the pleasure of working with both of these folks in the, in that program, now the School of Theater, and Sarah Bright, who was an arts management graduate, uh, likewise a student of mine way back in the day, uh, not that far back, not that far back, um, and Solomon Jogway from the Art and Visual Technology Program, whose work I have enjoyed uh, over the years. Uh, so welcome to all of you. Um, I will say one or two things about each of them, and then they're going to take some solo time on the screen to tell us in more detail. Uh, but AJ uh, did some professional acting after he graduated from George Mason, uh, and now is the, uh, among other professional uh, developments, is the co-founder and CEO of Waditech, which is a uh, consulting company that he'll tell us all about. Akande, also a wonderful performer, uh, is the founder and CEO of an events planning organization now for five or six years, I guess. Uh, you'll tell us the specifics, uh, called Unforgettable Main Events. Sarah Bright uh, is the owner of The Bright Solutions, which is uh, takes, in my view, the title, uh, the the prize for the best title of a of a self named company <laughs> uh, in uh, that I've ever heard, uh, and that's a team of of professionals who consult in the nonprofit sector. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about that. And Solomon is the co-founder of Saul Studios, and he is a multi disciplinary, multi talented artist who works in uh, all kinds of different media. And we're actually going to get to see a little clip of a recent uh, animated film that he made. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, kick everybody else out and, and talk to AJ for a minute. And we'll see the, all the rest of you in just a minute. 
AJ, it's good to see you. Thank you for having me. We, uh, uh, just for the, the sake of the audience, uh, AJ and I share a, a strong interest in aviation, and uh, we're not going to talk about that tonight, unfortunately, because that <laughs> would be a fascinating fascinating subject for, for the two of us anyway. Um, but you were an actor, uh, and I remember teaching you in directing class, um, and you went on to do some some independent films after graduation, and, and then you, you're, you found yourself on this very interesting career path that went through, oh, I don't know, Deloitte and, and some other interesting places. T tell us about Wadi Tech and, and how you got there. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I do appreciate it, and I I feel uh, honored to be here. And uh, you know, I remember the directing class. And uh, you know, you look at George Mason University, and you look at the you know the theater background that I had, and the acting career that I also you know had throughout my childhood into into early, I would say, late days of college. Um, you know, we live in a very interesting hub, which is Washington D.C. You know, it's a it's a city of opportunities, and so with with Washington D.C., I, I kind of shifted my career uh, from acting. I went on to do my masters also at George Mason, and that allowed me to and served me great, uh, you know, opportunities in Washington D.C. Working with some of the most, you know, uh, some of the best consulting firms, and and working with with some of the best DoD companies. And then went on to work um, as an entrepreneur. And here I am today. I'm a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I have Wadi Tech, which is my fourth tech venture. Um, and we do a lot of consulting and, and technology staffing with the Fortune 500 companies, as well as uh, the federal government and state and local governments. Um, you know, I, I just want to piggyback on what you said earlier, Rick, which is the, you know, the, a degree in the arts provides the person the ability to provide a wider range of, of, of thinking. And so that's what I think how the theater degree has served me throughout my career. I was not, you know, the, the, the typical guy in the room. I was the guy who was always uh, thinking outside the box. I was the guy who was very creative, and here I am in business strategy and, and building companies. And so I'm, you know, I think one of the things that I also want to add to that quickly, which is your directing class. Uh, I remember we had an assignment towards the class, which is we had to actually direct a five-minute scene. I remember that vividly because that allows me to kind of build on, you know, what we know now as a leadership and managerial abilities. And so I think. You know, if you look back at what we have learned at Mason, it's definitely contributed to my career and and the ability for me to be here today. Oh, that's uh, what a fantastic, uh, an unexpected um, a nod to the to the directing class. But but directing is is a form of leadership, and it is a form yeah. of uh, organizing collaborative energy. Uh, take take the acting perspective for just a moment, and and if you could isolate one or two things about working as an actor and all the training you did and all the experience you you had uh and how that equips you to be in the room with people in a in a non-artistic setting but in a way that's that's really engaged you, you know one of it is obviously public speaking uh the ability to you know uh comprehend and also tell a story we say actors uh they have the obligation to tell the story to the audience and so we're always, you know, in, in the form of, of leading companies and building companies and working with teams, you're always trying to tell a story and that's how you inspire teams. And so I think that's one of the biggest traits of me taking my theater background and actually infusing it into uh, in technology and, and leading companies today. Oh, that's fantastic. Storytelling is such a, an important skill and such an important gift. Um, and if you yeah. can tell a great story, you can you can get people to do all kinds of things. <laughs> um, and, and actually, uh, on a more serious on a more serious note, you can you can bring people together and and get their energies uh, unified. Um, I just one more question for you before we before we go into the next uh, panelist, and we'll, of course we'll bring you back at the end, and we'll have a a free for all discussion. Uh, tell me just another thing or two about Wadi Tech and, and how, how that company started and, and what your what your uh, main activity is. Uh, so as I serve as the CEO and co-founder of, of this organization, um, this organization is led by me and uh, obviously uh, my other co-founder. Um, and, you know, I don't come from the 
I would say the the typical staffing and consulting uh, background I come from actually building product companies. Uh, however, I think this venture has allowed us to kind of uh, grow our network and um, continue to serve in a very interesting times. We are today obviously facing a pandemic, uh, COVID, and so that has obviously put a lot of stress in um, you know across the, the markets and so. Uh, where we are today uh, as a company, we do have a mission, which is to put America back to work. We focus mainly on technology, uh, but we have been approached by uh, state and local governments and, and we've been kind of, uh, hmm. you know, honored to uh, work with them to, you know, again, put America back to work. It's, it's much needed in these uh, times. Well, terrific. That's a great mission and good luck. And we, I'm going to send you off now, but we're going to bring you back in, a, in just a few minutes uh, with the rest of your, your colleagues. So thanks, AJ. Great to see you. Thank you. And next up, we have Akande, who is, as we mentioned before, the founder and CEO of Unforgettable Main Events. How wonderful to see you. You too. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's, it's a delight. Uh, the The screen is filled with images of you and your work uh, <laughs> here. And uh, before we zoom in on any of those, uh, uh, can you give me just a sort of a quick summary of uh, how you decided to start your own major event planning and production company? Absolutely. Um, it actually was a surprise to me. I One, <laughs> I don't think I knew planning events was a career choice at the time that I started, you know, doing this or looking at this as a field. Many colleges didn't even have an events management major or, or anything like that. And so um, all of us from from my time when I started it, uh, when I started doing it, we, we kind of just learned off the cuff. And that, that actually was part of the attraction to it, that we got to design our own career path and and we got to decide what this should look like, what this should be. Um, but coming out of George Mason, um, the first surprise of my life that led to this career was just a love of production. Um, mm -hmm. I was a theater major, as you said, um, and enjoyed being on stage. But as a theater major, you get to experience or you have to experience all types of things, um, set design and set up, lighting, you know, all of those things. And so I a remember love of production. You start Sorry to jump in, but I remember you as as a literally as a producer and director. Um, mm -hmm. You 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 found, you co-founded a, a theater troupe on campus. Mm -hmm. uh, you put on some incredible productions, uh, and it's uh, that idea of being a producer, which is gathering all of the all of the elements of a production together. You could you could see it even then. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. Um... I started that company with Marcel Boyd and Millie Langford, and I believe you've had Millie as part of this yes, series. Yes, we have. Um, yes, we have. Um, you, know, you know, that's my girl. So we, we started that together. Um, and, you know, to carry on the narrative of, of telling a story. Um, somewhere in there, I fell in love with the idea of not just telling a story, but telling yours and making you fall in love with yours. And for me, that's what event planning is, is taking one moment of one person's life or one company's um, journey and making that their story for one night and have them fall in love with it or look at it differently through a different lens um, and experience it differently on a different level. And all of that started with just being thrown into classes that going into George Mason, I was like, I don't wanna do stage design and I don't wanna do I don't care about the costumes. Like I want to be on stage. That's my thing. Um, hmm. And finding out, no, it really isn't. <laughs> oh, huh, huh. It really is. Well, I, I want to zoom in on, on one of these pictures here. The the uh, the table setting, which is right there, and this strikes me as something that you probably created with somebody in mind. Um, the 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 acronym for your company, if I was reading your logo correctly, is it's unforgettable main events, but it's really unforgettable me, right? In in, uh, mm -hmm. in light of what, what you just said about creating the event that that you the client wants to see. Uh, so just mm -hmm. yeah, tell us tell us about these about these pictures that we're seeing at the bottom of our screen. Um, well, the the first one that I'm seeing is the one from the heart. Um, yes. And so I can start with that one, or I can start with the yeah. Like, go ahead. One, but yeah, we're zoomed in on that one. So, so tell us about the heart. The heart is a television show um, that was picked up by Fox in Virginia, and it started off as um, 
romance novels. Um, the author wrote a series of books um, under this title, The Heart. And they got picked up for a television show and contacted me and said, you know, we need to have a premiere event. We need to have cast events. Do you know anything about theater and how to throw a cast party and things like that? I was like, are you kidding me? Of course <laughs> I do. I'm not even going to tell you about the cast part, all the cast parties I attend because, you know, it, it probably won't get me hired. Um, <laughs> if you heard some of the things that I've done, but um, I was like, yeah, this, this sounds like a fabulous, fabulous opportunity. And it really was. It was my first um, television premiere that I got to plan. And we did VIP events, the red carpet events, um, and of course the actual premiere itself and at all the after parties. Um, and so it was a really, really wonderful experience and introduction to the company. It's one of the first events that we did. Um, the second picture is from speaking engagements, which is another thing that kind of branched off from events. I think when uh -huh. people think of event planners, um, or the events field, they think of one thing, and there's actually event planners, strate event strategists, event designers, um, event production artists. There's a whole range of careers that come out of this. Um, and one of them, uh, as I said, when, when I got into this, um, there wasn't a roadmap. And so a lot of my time now is speaking at conventions to other event planners, junior event planners and se seasoned ones about contract planning and strategy design and things like that. And so that's what that's from. And then that last picture that uh, we started out with, um, that was a dinner honoring um, some government guests. And uh, when we talk to them, usually I talk to my clients about what are the things that they love? What are the things that they wanna see in the room? Um, and what they loved was springtime and this event was happening mm. in the winter. Um, so <laughs> what they loved was, springtime and they wanted people to feel like they were really like the guests were being honored more than the person on the stage and so we really tried to create tablescapes that were um engaging that reminded them of springtime brought that into the room even though it was cold outside um and that had a lot of movement and joy in them and, and things like that just to get the feeling around the table um get people talking getting them feeling like they were um this was something that they could engage in, even if it's just one moment or one beat on the table, um, just getting them engaged and, and having fun. Wow, that's beautiful. It's such beautiful. And I can see both from these pictures and from your narrative, how every single thing that you ever did in the theater comes back in this uh, profession, uh, because it is it's design, it's production, it's, it's communication, mm -hmm. it's stage management, it's, uh, it's storytelling. Um, so that's that really inspiring. Well, we'll look forward to, to bringing you back on when we have our group. Uh, and now okay. I'm going to say hello to Sarah Bright from The Bright Solutions. And before, Sarah, before we start talking, I just want to uh, inform our audience that we are uh, taking questions in whatever chat feature you have on whatever platform you're using. Uh, so you can put them in at any time and our wonderful production staff will make sure that we see them. So from now till the end of the show, uh, please feel free to make comments or ask questions of, of uh, any of the panelists. So Sarah, PSA is concluded. Welcome to Cocktails and Conversations with the Dean. Uh, it's been many years since since we were together in, uh, in arts management uh, class, but um, I remember it fondly. And I have been so impressed with what you have done with your your career and especially this this latest manifestation, the Bright Solutions. Uh, tell us a little bit about the journey to that, and then how you set it up. Sure, sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's such a thrill to be able to to be with uh, this group, and uh, we're really performance heavy tonight. Two theater majors. Now here we are. Uh, my undergrad was voice performance. Yes, so indeed. So I uh, started it as a uh, classically trained singer. And that was career number one. And um, uh, but even during my undergrad, I was doing quite a bit of uh, uh, concert planning, uh, choral tour planning. I was starting to gravitate towards some of these other areas surrounding and supporting arts organization and, and, and artist endeavors. And um, 
went into in the few years before grad school did uh, some business management services specifically in accounting work and it's kind of had the idea oh wouldn't this be interesting to combine my mm. passion in the arts with accounting and so that was what led me to george mason university and i found the perfect fit with uh the master of arts and arts management and so um so i was brought into that program and at the same time was working with not-for-profit organizations in washington dc um, specifically at that time i was working with the washington chorus so again perfect fit choral world but i had this accounting skill set and so I was able to, um, as their director of finance, uh, provide some provide some work there. Um, after I graduated, I started to get have an interest in working with multiple organizations to expand what I was learning. That then led to a greater understanding of there really is a niche uh, in the Washington D.C. area and, and in many uh, areas around the country for um financial management services but many of our arts organizations do not have the budget to afford a full-time cfo and so thinking about the model of coming in and out as the organization needs finding a, a budget price point that works for them and so uh, originally it just started as me this was back in 2008 mm -hmm. and over time for the past over the past 12 years we've worked with 45 organizations um and it's we've been able to hire staff and it's been a, an incredibly rewarding experience do you uh does your company uh opera i think i know the answer from what you just said but i want to confirm does your company sort of are you on long-term uh, engagements with organizations or, are, or do you come in and do a specific job and then and then move on to the next or is it both yeah well again to follow up on some to piggyback a little bit on what some of the other panelists have talked about because we come from a creative background we engage with our clients in a creative way so mm. we don't have a platform that we say to our organizations and our executives this is what you need to do. We come to them and we listen and we find out where, where are the pain points currently? What can we design? Where, how can we work together? So we have short-term contracts, we have long-term contracts, we have interim assignments. Uh, we really try to do a comprehensive analysis. The nuts and bolts of it is there's, we, we handle everything, uh, probably about 90% of our work is in the not-for-profit fiscal cycle. So budgeting, payables, receivables, all those kinds of things. But we also have some really fantastic executive consultants that have worked with all kinds of organizations. And they also allow our services to extend beyond just financial management into business advisory, uh, executive consulting, maybe some coaching, some board development. So we've been able to really assist organizations and partner with these executive leaders um, in very creative and beneficial ways. That's a, an amazing portfolio of services. And I spent a little time on your on your website uh, in preparation for this conversation and was just impressed literally at the at the lateral breadth of the <laughs> of the homepage with with all of the different sort of baskets of services. And you've described some, but not not all of them even um, a, a truly, truly fascinating uh, development. Um, all right. Well, we're going to come back to you uh, in a few minutes here and we're going to hear more about the bright solutions and uh, I'm going to ask you and, and everybody, uh, but I'm mentioning it now before I forget, uh, that we're going to talk a little bit about current events and, and pandemic-related accommodations and adjustments. We've already alluded to that in a couple of uh, a couple of segments. But so, thank you, Sarah. We'll see you in just a few minutes. And now thank it you. is my great pleasure to welcome to the screen Solomon Jagwe, uh, art and visual technology major and uh, animator and filmmaker par excellence. And Solomon, before we start the actual uh, movie here, I want you to pick up one of those uh, little pipe cleaner toys that you were showing us earlier during the soundcheck. And just tell us, just tell me about that 
incredible thing. And then we'll play All a right, movie. So, <laughs> thank you so much, Rick. Uh, I really, uh, I, I'm uh, so grateful for this opportunity to share uh, my journey here. But this right here is uh, called Gali in my language. And so the the materials that come from, you know, from Walmart, from Target, but it's uh, pipe cleaners. And when I was growing up in Uganda, deep in the village, we, you know, barefoot, we didn't have toys. So we used to create our own toys back in, in Uganda. So I've been teaching my kids how to create their own toys. Oh, that's fantastic. It's so, it's so beautiful. And I, I think it's a great uh, introduction to your film. So we're, gonna, we're just gonna watch about um, 40 seconds or so of your film and then we'll continue our conversation. But uh, everybody sit back, relax and enjoy the work of Solomon Jagwe. Oh, so beautiful. Thank you so much. That's incredible. Uh, I, I, just so, so many things to talk about. But the first thing I want to talk about is your, your journey from Uganda to the United States and, and how you found George Mason and, and, and where that has led you. Yes. Yeah, so I came to this country as an immigrant. And I mean, I grew up in Uganda, like I was saying, in the village, and I've always been a storyteller at heart. Even at the age of three, my mom tells me I used to pick up sticks and build like little houses. And so when I was in Uganda, the system of education there didn't offer us the kind of opportunities that are here in the U.S. So it's essentially, you know, pursuing the American dream, but bringing my African dream with me <laughs> to the U.S. I wanted to learn more how to bring my stories to life. I mean, I used to look up in the air and see these creatures flying in the air. We had no TV in, in, uh, in the village. We had no radio. So all I, th I thought they were like metallic birds flying in the air. And so coming here, uh, this, after I joined boarding school in Uganda and going to uh, secondary school, they, there were options. I could have gone to the uh, state-funded university in Uganda but there was, for me, my passion was uh, telling stories. And I'd heard that in America, they, were, they, they would teach me <laughs> how to make films, mm -hmm. like the ones we used to see on TV in the city, that is. And so I came to the US uh, in 1996, and uh, I met my wife the first day of uh, university. I was in Ohio Valley University, but they didn't have uh, animation there. So I ended up transferring to Maryland uh, and then I went to Montgomery College and did a, a, an Associate of Applied Science degree in art and animation. Uh, then I interned for the Pentagon uh, part-time. And then when I graduated from uh, Montgomery College, they hired me full-time uh, as an animator and 3D artist. And then while I was at uh, that uh, uh, game studio, it was a military, we were making military games. And uh, they were used for recruitment. So if you are at a university and you see the military recruiting, they would offer you a video game that then you take home and play. But they were along as you're playing, there were subliminal messages, join the Navy, join the Air Force, join the Army. And so that's how I got into the, the 3D animation field. And then the company offered to pay for my education. So I did, uh, I came to George Mason and majored in art and visual technology uh, and I was uh, under the tutelage of uh, my professor, uh, Professor Gail Scott. That's yes. <laughs> she taught me so much, yes. you know, about uh, animation. And one thing that she really uh, uh, brought out in us was the ability to work in a team. Most of the projects that we did, we were encouraged to do to be team members of a project, so that you learn to work with other people, you learn to listen to other people, you learn to share ideas. Because even the job that I was doing. 
And as much as I was uh, the lead animator, I still had to find ways to convey my ideas. And I had to listen because I was working in a military circle, you know, mm -hmm. and they are very, very specific about the things that they want done. And so if you, can't, if you don't have the ability to listen and translate their ideas into the visions, because whatever we created was used to train soldiers uh, strategy and simulation of like going to Iraq and Afghanistan and how to do battle like in places like in Somalia. Yes, that's what an incredible, incredible journey. And I've, I've learned seven or eight things I didn't know uh, <laughs> already. Uh, that's, that's, that's terrific. Uh, and of course, um, you are a filmmaker uh, as well yeah. as a, a visual artist. The two things are, are so deeply integrated in, in your work. Uh, I was struck in seeing this, this uh, short film now a couple of times, the quality of the imagery, the lighting, the, the texture, the depth has a painterly yeah. feel to it. It's, it's, just, it's just really, really so beautiful. Uh, um, this is kind of a dumb question, I think, but how, how, how do you see light and color and depth so thoroughly and so so richly and so beautifully when it's when it is in fact a um, you know an electronic screen it's not it's not paint yeah. and it's not <laughs> material and it's not you know. yeah i think having a, a traditional art background helps because i i was a painter and a sculptor before I came to the US. So I was, uh, I used to peddle my paintings and sculptures. I used to work with uh, wood and stone. And so mm. you, I had mm -hmm. to be very observant. I had to be more observant than the next person. You know, that's how I learned to look at yeah. uh, nature. And I was fortunate to have grown up in Uganda because our country is so beautiful. <laughs> There's so much color in our clothing, in our the, the landscape, the vegetation and all that. And I think some of the classes that we took you know, like they told us, they told me that I had to take appreciation of music. I was like, how, how is that going to help me with art? You know, but music has colors, you know, and when I hear a song, I am visualizing something. And it actually is a great medium to communicate emotion and the message. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, good. I'm, well, I'm glad I asked that dumb question because I, I, I see something so te textural in, in, in your work. Uh, one more quick thing before we uh, bring the rest of the panel on. Uh, tell us a little bit about Sowell Studios. Yes. So Sowell Studios is a, an art animation company where my wife and I, we co-founded it. And it was inspired by our two kids. So those two characters you see on the screen, uh, uh, they are voiced by my daughter. And the, uh, my son is the voice uh, actor for, for the little boy. Oh, fantastic. And Yeah. And so my, my wife is African-American and I am Ugandan. So we are a multiracial family. But we're trying, we're trying to find ways to teach our children my language. My wife was desperate for that because she wanted us to, she wanted them to have roots to our, the African heritage. And so we came up with an app called The Adventures of Nkosa Anancha. It's, a, it's available on iOS. Uh, Android and Amazon, and our kids you, were using that to learn times from Uganda and some of the languages in there. Yeah, so that's how the company oh, came beautiful. to be. So, so, that lunch is our Soul, Soul Studios, very good. Oh, that's terrific. Thank you. Wonderful, Solomon. All right, so we're now going to bring the entire panel back on to the screen. Hello, everybody. I I hope you enjoyed watching each other as much as I enjoyed uh, <laughs> hearing hearing and seeing. Uh, your work. Um, we'll have a, just a few minutes of sort of a free for all here um, where I want to, I have a couple of questions I want to tease out. I want to remind our audience that uh, the question feature is available. So please send your questions and comments to this distinguished panel of artist entrepreneurs. Uh, the first question I've already sort of telegraphed is, uh, and each of you can answer this or, or or as many as, as would like to, how has your work changed in the last, um, what is it now, um, year almost of um, pandemic life? Uh, and, and what sort of accommodations have you made? And I'll just, I'll take volunteers for this. <laughs> Who would like to? Well, I'm uh, happy to I'll, I'll... jump in. <laughs> <laughs> <Everyone>. <laughs> I think I heard Sarah first, but we'll, but everybody could get a chance if you want to. Sure. So um, this is like being in class with a lot of really great students. You know, they're all jumping up <laughs> to answer the, answer the question. Um, 
we were the bright solutions. We were maybe ahead of the curve uh, because we were zooming two or three years ago. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of you know doing predominantly accounting work, a lot of coaching, consulting. We were getting to more of a, a remote model anyway, and so some of that has been very easy. So that part of the transition has been easy. We've seen a significant uptick in the organizations that we work with that have some sort of social service component. So our organizations that are food banks, that are uh, really speaking to specific populations that are the hardest hit, we're seeing, it's a, it's a positive change, we're seeing a significant increase in funding and so therefore there's more work that we can do to go in and partner and ensure that uh, resources are being managed appropriately. So those are just a few of the examples of how things have changed for us. Great, thank you. I, I don't know who was next, but I know there were several of you, so. I can jump Go in ahead. There. The Conde, like. yeah, great. Um, great. So um, I too have been working from home technically, um, but not really for the last maybe five years. Um, but my staff is is all over the place um, in different states. Um, I have two members, two staff members who are actually in different countries. Um, and so Zoom and all of that always is how we use, you know, what we use to bring each other together. Um, but with events, of course, there's been a drastic change in how our attendees experience the work. Um, and so we've had to help clients reimagine, if it's a corporate client, reimagine um, how do you create a human experience, especially now um, when people are so hungry for just hanging out and just laughing loud and, and, and really feeling a moment, being in the center of a moment. Um, how, do you, how do you help them have that in a virtual environment? Um, for, for my staff, the charge was, and I'm sorry, I'm going to tell you a little story to give context. Um, no, please, yeah. I was doing events for a company, um, for a different company, and when I went out on my own and I had my first client, um, there was an attendee when we were on the conference room floor who came, who asked one of my staff members if they could meet, you know, the planning team. And so I thought there was something wrong. I was like, what is that? Um, and so I met them and he goes, I know you. Um, I always look the same on the floor. It helps to create a, a sense of peace and, you know, um, consistency with the attendees. So I always have a flower in my hair. I always like, um, he's like, I, I remember the flower. I remember you. Um, and he said, I, I wanted to, he had, um, some needs that needed to be accommodated for. He said, I just wanted to say thank you for thinking about folks with my, you know, my disability and, and things like that. I can see that throughout the conference. And um, I've only seen that once when I went to this other conference and he named the company that I worked for before. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, that was a signal of, I always want someone to know when they're in my care, right? You always want to create that consistent level of service. And so while we were charging our, our um, clients with um, reimagine how people have a human experience and interaction with each other in this moment, um, for my staff it was always, and they need to know that they're in our care, that I need to know no matter what conference you're at or event you're at, that you see something that is especially for you, that you felt thought about, heard, seen, um, and so we've done that through different ways. We've had virtual happy hours where we've actually sent care boxes, um, to the attendees who were, um, signed up for that VIP happy hour. So when they all came together, they all had a box that was especially designed for them. Um, we've created, um, gratitude cards like virtual gratitude cards where people come in and they actually do a video or something to say thank you to another person that's unexpected um mm. just create different moments where they interact differently um and i think people have to 
even if, as, as, as the world continues to change, as we continue to transition, um, because I don't think we'll ever see the human experience the way we did before. And so we have to really think about hybrid events and what those look like um, and still making people feel like they hugged you, laughed with you, had a moment with you, um, experienced something with you. And so that's that's what a lot of our work has been now is just reimagining um, the human experience and, and how we can highlight that. That's terrific. It, it reminds me of, of our uh, attempts to keep our CVPA mission alive um, in these times and and sort of creating those alternative experiences that you're talking about uh, and you have, you have some very creative ideas which I think we'll steal um, we, we like we like to say that um, we have the world's shortest elevator speech in CVPA and it's four <laughs> words the the arts create community right we just the the mm -hmm. arts create community um, and the challenge of maintaining that community uh, when we're not together in the same way. Uh, we have to be more creative. Um, so yeah. thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, anybody else on the on the sort of we have some nice questions coming in from from YouTube, but I want to make sure that that uh, AJ and Solomon, if you if you want to talk about sort of adjustments to life, um, I'd be happy to hear it. Yeah, I mean, some of the things that we have um seen obviously during pandemic is uh, you know we're i'm a big believer in co-working in in one location but obviously we have consultants uh, across the united states and so we obviously had to be forced to uh kind of reshift our priorities and and think how we can work uh, with our consultants um, and we have an obligation obviously to keep everyone safe uh, but also accommodate our clients and make sure that you know our, our clients are actually uh, being taken care of. Um, so one thing that I noticed that was actually quite interesting is that despite the fact that management wanted to make sure that everyone continues to work from home, a few months into the pandemic, we started to see immediately that people wanted, wanted to go back to the office. Mm -hmm. And so we've started to seeing requests from, you know, teams here in the DC office and then across the US that, you know, what can we do to come back to the office? Can you guys actually you know, create a, uh, a conducive environment for everyone to come back into the office. And so we had to create a, a hybrid uh, sort of uh, approach to this particular issue and uh, open our offices and, and create unique schedules and, and put into protocols in place and accommodate everyone. So I think that's that's quite interesting. Yeah, thank you. And Solomon, uh, what is what is Soul Studios doing differently, if anything, in, in yeah. this? Uh... Uh, a lot, uh, a lot of things uh, are being done differently, especially when it comes to animation. Because there was a time when you could meet with actors, you know. There was a time when yeah. you could actually yeah. go you know, location <laughs> scouting. Those days are kind of uh, changed. We're no longer the same. And for us, when we started out, we we knew um, Cosa Nancha was going to be our flagship product, but we didn't know how much need there would be in this pandemic. So in March of uh, last year, we had about 800 downloads of the app. Right. As I speak, we have about 10,000 downloads uh, in over 140 mm. countries. So people from all over the world are now consuming the animation content that before we would have maybe focused on. Maybe we get a, a, something to go in theaters. Maybe we got something to go, you know, but now it's digital. You know, wherever people are, they can access our content. And uh, animation wise, the tools have also changed because most of the animation that we do is uh, we're using motion capture, you know, equipment to be able to do that kind of information. So like we have the, the mother of our uh, two main characters is based in the UK, the voice actor. And so she literally sends us videos, you know, from the UK, and then we use the technology to track her face, but then we apply it to the character. So that has changed for sure. Wow. That's that's fantastic. All right, I'm going to turn to our audience questions because we, we have probably more than, than we have time for, but we'll do our best. Uh, the first one, uh, is for uh, anybody uh how do you recruit and maintain quality staff that's a that's a big question and i need you to give short answers but wise answers who would who would like to be brief but wise on recruiting and retaining quality staff it's an incredible 
Incredible. Well, my, my uh, strategy maybe. has been to go back to CVPA and to yes. <laughs> <laughs> recruit uh, former students and and retired deans and program directors. So watch out, Rick. I'm coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. That's that's a very good answer. Yeah. Any, anybody else? Have Mine a, actually has been Rick, one of Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Conde first and then AJ. No, we'll take a Conde first and then and then AJ. I was going to say mine has been similar, um, even not just with my company, but when I work with other companies, um, I was trying to figure out how to get events, um, volunteers in to help with large shows if we had like a 25,000 person or a citywide show. Um, and so when you all had your event management major, I was like, do they need clock hours? Because I got you. Don't even worry about that. Um, same thing with George Washington University or, and from that, I just met so many different folks who were eager for the work, eager to learn. Um, and so some of them are, are my staff. <laughs> oh, that's um, fantastic. Yeah. And our, our events production minor is going really well, uh, which is a, a joint program between the School of Theater and the, and the Tourism and Events uh, Management program in the, in the Education College. So good for you for hiring I'll our I'll be knocking our on folks. your door. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrific. AJ, what did you have on your mind? Uh, you know, I wanted to say that we've actually hired uh, throughout, you know, our journey with Wadi Tech so many great uh, graduates from, from George Mason. So, you know, wow. uh, we can't say we're biased, but we've hired many actual uh, great, uh, you know, staff member from, from George Mason. And we continuously reach out to the Career Center there at, at George Mason to actually hire from, from the school in which I graduated. Um, but one of the things that we always kind of keep track uh, and we're always looking to uh, grow people by uh, you know enabling them to um, get you know content and, and education um, that is appropriate uh, in the fields of, of uh, in which they're kind of serving our clients and so we're always trying to help people learn and grow and and that's a way for us to continue to uh, retain uh, you know valuable employees well here is a question that is actually almost a segue from that. Um, also from one of our YouTube listeners, what advice do you have for those current CVPA students in your fields for exploring entrepreneurship in their future? And again, this could, be, this say, could be for anybody. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a very I'm a guy who's very passionate about entrepreneurship. I speak at conferences and I talk about entrepreneurship you because know, I've built so many ventures. And so one of the things that I actually would like to say to you know. Um, uh, students coming out of the CVPA, uh, correct? Am I saying that right? CVPA uh, program is it. the the fact that everyone has different experience. Uh, you know, I, I went to school, I did theater as an undergrad, and then went on to do global affairs and global economics also at Mason. Uh, but everything that you're doing at that program will enable you to, uh, you know, kind of accomplish something later on in life. Uh, so, Take the opportunity to learn and use every single thing that you are, uh, you know, uh, enjoying in, in classes and, and think about how you can actually utilize that uh, for a venture that you're thinking about. Mm. And, and I think that's where the value is. Great. Who else I think like also, um, I was going to say, think about whether or not you honestly want to be an entrepreneur. I think. Um, for myself, um, as Rick mentioned, this wasn't the first entrepreneurial venture that I started, um, and and that's not to say that you won't start many or or you know multiple. But um, entrepreneurship isn't for everybody. It's not. I think it's not what everybody thinks it is. You have to learn things like marketing and and things that had have nothing to do with your actual focus. And so, if you don't love that, if you don't, if you don't, if you can't learn to love the things that you never wanted to do. Um, this will be a hard road for you. So really think about whether or not entrepreneurship is what you want to do um, and, and understand that with that decision, um, you likely will not be doing, like I'm not doing the day-to-day -day things that got me into this field in the first place. I have people that do that for me. I'm not with every client. I'm not on every conference or wedding or whichever floor. I'm not, um, you know, looking at tablescapes anymore. I am looking at budget and hiring and, and marketing strategies and, um, you know, those types of things, which has, in the beginning, feels like it has absolutely nothing to do with 
the thing you fell in love with. So just uh, think about that and, and decide if that's really where you want to go or what you want to do. That's great. Solomon, yeah, I think you were going to say something. Yeah, if I may add, uh, if first find, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to have to find a product that is going to make a difference. Because if you don't have something that people want, you know, that is going to change their lives, that's going to impact them, you're going to fail <laughs> as an entrepreneur. Because then there's nothing to actually drive you, you know, towards the goals that you're trying to achieve. And um, if, like Akande said, if you are thinking of entrepreneurship as what you are, for example, I'm an, an, an artist, I love to draw, I love to animate, but I don't get to do that as often as I want to, you know, so you find yourself doing other things because I hate management, <laughs> but I had to learn <laughs> how to, to, to do that. If you hate dealing with people, entrepreneurship is not a very good thing to, you know, to jump into. Right, so right. You got to check inside here, like, how excited are you with dealing with difficult, you know, personalities? Because if you, if you, if you hate it, please don't do it. <laughs> don't, don't jump into it. Yes. Or call Sarah Bright and the Bright Solutions and she'll do it for you. That's right. But hire the right. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a we have one or two more questions. We're going to try to work them in. Uh, this one is actually specifically for Akande because it's in a it's an events uh, question. Um, even when it's safe to gather in large groups again, what do you hope event planners will continue to apply for guests who prefer to attend remotely due to limited finances, disabilities, compromised immune systems, other any other obstacles? So what are we going to take forward? And actually, there's a, this is this question actually extends beyond uh, events, but let's start with the events world. What are we taking forward uh, post pandemic? Um, one of the greatest things that I learned in theater um, that I carry forward in my business now is just social emotional intelligence, right? Mm. You have to be able to read, even when someone doesn't have the schema, when they don't have the vocabulary to describe what someone needs. And so um, looking at now, when I, when I plan something, um, I look at all the registration forms in the past. Somebody registers for my event, I need to know what have they gone to that I've planned in the past. So I already know what their habits are, what their needs are. Um, and if I don't have that, then I find out. I say, let's, let's contact this attendee and see um, what are they getting from this experience? We're excited to have them find out what they're looking for in this experience. Um, and I hope that we had to deepen that during this virtual moment, right? Um, in order to make people feel like they're still connected, we had to deepen our social emotional intelligence. And I hope when we go into hybrid events or live events, um, we don't forget that. We don't forget um, that people still feel need to feel protected um, because it's not like it's going to be a switch that we turn off, right? And people are like, oh, okay, great, it's safe. Um, people are still going to need to feel protected. Um, they're still going to need to see that you are as concerned about their health and welfare and what they're getting out of this experience, be it PD, um, empowerment, whatever, um, that you care just as much about them getting that out of that bit as they do. Um, and if they can't find, um, they can't come out in mass. I always feel like, it, I always say, if you can't, if I can't make you feel like you're in mass, I can still make you feel empowered to do something, mm -hmm. to move a different way, to feel a different way. Um, and so I hope that we, keep those same goals moving forward too, whether they're with us in person or not, um, have a really impactful and reachable goal for those who are attending virtually, just like you do with those who are attending live, um, and figure out a strategy to make them, be, to help them be a part of that moment and feel empowered from wherever they are. They don't have to be with you in order to feel that. Great. Anybody else have a, a thought about the post-pandemic life and what we might bring forward We're working from home rick is here to stay and we just have to uh, i i think identify ways to um for teams that are working remotely especially for for companies in, in technology and, and consulting uh, of, you know incorporating culture uh you know from while people are working remotely and i think that's that's going to be you know here for for some time and uh we're just going to have to uh figure out as entrepreneurs ways to continue to engage, engage our teams and, and continue to build proper company cultures. 
Great. And, and I'll just add a word, um, speaking as someone who's, whose um, portfolio, if you will, includes uh, performance and exhibition venues, uh, you know, we CBPA creates and, and presents an awful lot of visual and performing art in a given year. Um, I think our goal is to realize that we have reached many, many, many new people uh, over the course of this pandemic uh, and people that might not have found us otherwise uh, for any number of obstacles, whether it's economic or social or distance or, or what have you. And so we want to stay in touch and we want to bring them closer and closer and, and maybe come into the, you know, into the family, as it were, uh, just just like a, a live audience, but but mediated over over distance. So it's a I think it's a moment full, it's full of promise if we get it right. And you guys have have helped uh, articulate some some really good ideas. Uh, time for one more question. And I'd like to hear from each of you on this. We touched on it just a tiny bit in, in our one on ones at the top of the hour. But a questioner has has asked for a little bit more. Uh, and it's a great way to end the conversation. How has your experience in CBPA opened up opportunities to your business? Well, I can't wait to hear the answers to this one. Who wants to start with with that? Sarah, I see your, I don't know if that's a raised all, hand or. I'm always ready to go. Um, I <laughs> was right. told in the, in the arts management program to find professionals that you admire and get as close to them as you can and watch and do what they do. And um, I, in the program, it was really wonderful because our professors weren't just lectures, they also were managers. And so we got this incredible academic mixture combined with the practical and we got to see that and experience that. So I always recommend when someone comes to me for advice, get as close as you can and really emulate those that you respect and admire because that's how you begin to walk the walk. Terrific, thank you. Solomon, what about you? Do you have a, a thought about that? Yes, um, I think one, like, especially since we're talking about the pandemic, uh, the need to have a portfolio that speaks volumes, you know, because that mm. when I was in the APT program, they encouraged us uh, to always pre prepare something, you know, back then we used, we had portfolios that were, you could carry it, <laughs> you know, to uh, yes. an, like a, an interview. But now it's all digital, so you have to present yourself very well online so that you can, you know, they can see what you can do. And I think, uh, you know, being able to draw or illustrate or whatever, those things have to be on either your website. If you don't, even if you don't have a, 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 the funds to uh, get a domain name, at least uh, get WordPress, you know, put something online that can show your potential employer what you can do. The, you know, that's that's what I, I was told, and I think when I when I applied for the job at the Pentagon, the the military uh, contractor, they, I was up going up against about twenty other candidates, and they had masters uh, masters in art, and all I had was a portfolio at the time. You know, I had taken like six months off and drew all the kinds of things that I wanted to do at the job. I knew I wanted to do military centric content, so I drew military trucks. I do Humvees. I do AK-47s, you know, m one for and all those things. So that's what gave me a foothold into the getting the job itself, yeah. That's great. Thank you. AJ, what about you? Uh, Rick, there is actually, it's, a, it's an interesting story. Uh, one of the reasons um, I became an entrepreneur is because of my degree in theater, believe it or not. Uh, so while working at Deloitte, uh, I got actually to ask, I, I was asked to join their innovation practice. And that was the turning point in my career. I, I was one of the first people who helped build their innovation practice, uh, the first in the United States. And I remember the senior manager calling me uh, and saying, tell me something about your theater background. And I said, is this guy joking? <laughs> uh, and so that's kind of the turning point. You know, they were interested in my business strategy and technology background, but they were trying to see and gauge my creativity uh, in actually working with uh, Silicon uh, Valley kind of startups and, and bringing a lot of that into Deloitte and, and building a new revenue model for the company. And so 
that's a turning point in my career. And so here I am today uh, because of, you know, the experience, it helped me. So I would just add to that, um, one of the things that always all the students, hopefully that are watching this, they should, you know, you know, embrace the the degree uh, that they're getting from CVPA and try to, again, like leverage it in, in various ways. And if they're trying to be entrepreneurs, in which I encourage everyone to be an entrepreneur and, and go through that particular experience because it's fascinating and you'll learn a lot. There's nothing in the world that teaches you more than being an entrepreneur is the fact that you can use your theater background or your, your creative background and leverage it in various fields. So don't just you know get stuck in one field, use it in, in various ways and means. Don't get stuck. That's great advice. <laughs> Thank you. Great story. Akanda, you have the last word. Um, I would say always, always rely on those that you know. When I first went into this field and decided I was going to step out on my own, Rick was one of the first people that I called and was like, hey, <laughs> I think I'm going to do a thing. Um, and I need your advice. And I had been out of school for quite some time at that point. And he was like, let's meet, let's talk. So always lean on those you know. Um, and stay flexible um like i said this career has taken me around the world and um you know the speaking engagements to um working with with government to working with um startups stay flexible um and always always um understand your why um i think for a lot of us in in the arts um, we understand in some way, somewhere in our being, we understand that our job is to always be in service to others, whether or not it's to help them experience something different or see themselves differently. Um, our job is to open the aperture. And so this moment is actually really exciting for those who have the skill set and all of you have the skill set to do that. Um, so always, always remember, especially when it gets hard. Um, if what you're doing is not in service to someone else and helping them experience this world differently or better, um, then you're probably headed the wrong way um, in, in your in your career field. You might want to change or or, re or adjust some things. Um, again, as I as I talked earlier, and I, t I said, even if we're not in mass, we can always be empowered. Um, I remember yeah. when the um, Ahmad Arbery situation happened. Um, we, of course, could not, the run for Ahmad happened and we could not be together to run. Um, but I can send you a checklist and a care package. I can turn you into an event planner so that you can find community right where you are and say how you do a neighborhood run. This is how you plan a neighborhood run. Um, this is how you check on your neighbors or how you run for a neighbor that can't run or can't walk. This is how you create community right where you are, even if you can't be here with me. So I may not be able to be directly with you but you can find community where you are. Make sure that you're doing that whatever you're doing is in service to making people or helping people experience the world differently or see themselves differently. Um, and you'll you'll find the you'll find the the juice to keep going. Mm. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for this conversation. I have a lot of uh, moments of pride and pleasure in in being the dean of CVPA, but none more than on a night like tonight when I get to see and talk to some really, really fine alumni who are doing great work in the world. And I just want to thank you for the, your gift of, of time and talent and generosity in, in being here tonight. And to our audience, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your good questions and comments. And we will see you again on March 8th for the next installment of Alumni cocktails and conversations with the dean by the way here's my cocktail i'm not telling you what it is. oh it's just sparkling water but cheers everybody oh, i'm a and bourbon we'll girl you... so <laughs> <laughs> perfect we'll see you on march 8th and the title of that sub of that episode is working nine to five making your degree work with you so again aj akande sarah solomon good thank night. you thank you cheers, cheers. take care